Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute for our program, Misanthropic Moralist, with celebrating the Russian writer Vladimir Sorokin, author of Teloria, in conversation with the translator and also tonight as the interpreter, Max Lawton. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of the Dennis Durkin Mechanics Institute. And tonight we're very proud to present this event with Lit Quake, Dolphin Archive, and New York Review Books. Of course, you've all seen the Lit Quake programs, so I hope that you'll enjoy all of the events that are happening in the next 10 days, all through the city. And please fill out your survey. And at the end of the evening, if you put your survey in the basket that's at the front door, we really appreciate it. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Jack Bowar and uh, Jane Bell, and also to Linda Thomas for our collaboration. <laughs> if you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, which is on the second and third floors. Our chess club, which is down the hallway, and there's a chess tournament going on tonight. And our literary programs and our similar film series, which is on the front of the house. So visit our website and please join us for our events. This talk will be followed by a QA with your audience, and also folks will be on sale after the program, and you will have your folks on by our office, which will also be here tonight. Vladimir Sorokin's book is very controversial. He is a political provocateur, one of Russia's most controversial writers in exile. His new book, Teloria, offers a cautionary tale set in a future feudal dystopia with warring zealots and tribal herders. Vladimir Sorokin was born in a small town outside of Moscow in 1955. He's trained as an engineer at the Moscow Institute of Oil and Gas, but turned to art and writing, becoming a major presence in the Moscow underground in 1980. His work was banned in, in the Soviet Union with his first novel, The Cube, which is also available from the New York Review of the Review of Books Classics, and was published by the famed emigrant dissident Andre Sinyaski in France in 1985. In 1992, Soroka's Therefore Hearts was shortlisted for the Russian Booker Prize, but was also very controversial, as well as his Blue Lard, which caused demonstrations in the street. In 2001, he received the Andre Belli Award for Outstanding Contributions to Russian Literature, and his work has been translated into more than 30 languages. He is also a screenwriter and, uh, and also has written for opera and plays and short stories, and has won the O. Henry Award for several of his works. He is currently living in the Nukova, the, the new car, how to get the accent on the right place, and also in Berlin. Max Lawton is a novelist, musician, and translator. His translations of Vladimir Sorokin's stories have appeared in The New Yorker and N Plus One. In addition to eight Sorokins of books, forthcoming from the New York Review of Book Classics and Dolphy Archive Press, he is translating two books by Jonathan Mattel, and he's here from New York. So please welcome our esteemed guests, Vladimir Sorokin and Max Lawson. Hello. Yeah. 
So basically, um, we're think we're going to read it. We got uh, like forty minutes, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the work we've done, introduce it a little, and then we're going to read a new story that is not available anywhere. Um, so that should be pretty fun. But basically, um, to begin with, we were sort of thinking we'd talk a little bit about um, how the reception of the work has. Uh, been different given that we're dealing with two radically different periods. Um, we're sort of at the same time putting out Vladimir's latest novel and then his very early novel. And if you know Vladimir's work, you know there's a very big difference. Um, so therefore, arts is quite an extreme look, whereas um, Gloria is a little bit more gentle and nice, even though stylistically it is also quite extreme. So, um, Vladimir, what do you, how does it feel to you? To be dealing with these two radically different periods in your work being uh, released to the English world at once. Okay. <clears throat> Better we should say a few words about how it all began. Я в юности серьезно занимался рисованием и живописью. In my youth, I uh, seriously occupied myself with drawing and painting and thought that I was going to be an artist. Yeah, you'll say, well, the Kavita of the Sudaski, you said, well, uh, we were a cool artist, we were a witness to the but I was born in a totalitarian state, and to choose such a profession was uh, a hard thing to do. The state exerted a lot of pressure on us back then, including in terms of profession. So I didn't actually get into art school, but I got into the Institute of Oil and Gas. But was right next door. My dad worked there and helped not to get into the army. Well, studying at the institute, I did continue to occupy myself with drawing and graphics. You visit the in the later years of my study, I began to work professionally as a book designer, a book illustrator. And in parallel fashion, I was working on these sort of uh, surreal drawings. Uh, 
пожалуйста, мы здесь клиент один художник, который рисует странные картины. And once a woman, my dentist, said that one of her patients was uh, an artist, and he drew these sort of very strange pictures. Name was very cool. And she offered to show my work to him. Понял, что я попал в московский underground. Круг людей, которые делают что-то запретное. <coughs> into a circle of people who do something forbidden, free, and original. И uh, попробовал что-то сам написать. Began to visit the Lockwood's workshop as well as other artists. I met with writers of the underground, and I began to try to write something myself. Как литератор. As, as a writer myself. У меня был опыт раньше. Я подростком написал несколько. I tried this out as a teenager before I'd written a few fantastic stories. Not fantastic as in very good, but fantastic. Including one erotic story. Это получилось так легко, что мне пришлось сказать, что я перевел этот рассказ с английского. It came to be so easily that I had to actually say that I translated from I translated it from English. Yeah, uh, it made its way through our school. After that, it seemed to me the literature is a very easy occupation, so I continued to draw. И вот, собственно, в андеграунде я вспомнил собственную литературу. So it was in the underground that I sort of recalled my own literary experience. И то, что получилось, другие участники андеграунда оттуда. And that which I did, other uh, members of the underground um, so it. And that's how it all began, basically. If we're to speak of the early texts, they were essentially uh, coming out of Stoke's art. What is Sotsart? What uh pop art You know what pop art is, of course. Well, America, America is the motherland of pop art. Sots art is a pop art ma material. So it's art, it's pop art made with Soviet visual propaganda. 
Я стал это же делать на материале официальной советской литературы, использующей метод соцреализма. I began to do this uh, with uh, official Soviet literature using the method of socialist realism. И, и, um, если говорить о ранних рассказах, они выйдут в следующем году. То это были такие бинарные бомбочки. If we're talking about the early stories, they're going to come out next year in the from Dalkin and Clarkson called Dispatches on the District Committee. These uh, stories in general were binary bombs. То есть Первая часть текста начиналась как стопроцентный социализм. А потом эти герои как бы сходили с ума. And then these uh, characters, as it were, lost their minds. Это был мой метод. This was my method in the 80s. После того, как рухнул Советский Союз, рухнул и социализм. But after the Soviet Union fell, of course, uh, socialist realism also collapsed. Я семь лет не писал романов тогда. I didn't write novels for seven years back then. Потому что Жизнь менялась очень быстро, и писатель не мог уследить за ней. А потом уже нашли совсем другие тексты, не связанные с социализмом. So, but that's interesting because I think a lot of, you've spoken about this before, we've talked about it on this tour even, that um, your own career is sort of like a binary bomb, right? Where you have the, the early text and then you have the later text, which almost become a, a little bit more conventional in a sense because they're more recognizably operating within the Russian tradition. They're a little bit less conventional, a little bit more kind. Um, but it's interesting to think about the transition because obviously what you just described is up to Blue Lard, right? So what, what happened from Blue Lard to Teluria? What that 10 year period is interesting to me. If you look at um, from Blue Lard to Pier Peace to then um, to then uh, the blizzard, you know, um, on that phone. How, how do you do you think there was as much of a change in that tenure period as there were as there was from the early text to Blue Lard, or is it sort of a similar were you operating in a similar mode the whole time? Каждая книга должна быть написана собственным стилем и иметь как бы собственную идеологическую и uh, интеллектуальную задачу. Um, it's difficult to speak of an entire period, of course. Um, given that my, and this is given that my principle is that every book should be written in its own style and should have its own ideological and intentive task. Они как бы написаны, ну что ли, разными писателями, как бы. 
It's as if they're written by a different writer that's in. There are a lot of them. Maybe because of that, critics in my homeland in the 90s said that Sorokin isn't a real writer because he doesn't have his own uh, constant and consistent style. But um, uh, avoiding or getting away or uh, refracting a constant style actually is my style. Uh, uh, it's difficult to say why it is this way. It's the writer's kitchen, which is a fairly uh, dark drawer, as it were. And basically, every writer can make out very little within himself. But other writers can see into the, a writer and other critics can as well. Although, of course, there are very few good critics, of course. What can I ask? Well, if we're talking about, because I think we're going to read the story pretty soon because it's a, a short program. It's interesting to think about then if you could characterize, I mean, if you could even characterize at all the change that, because you're very good at explaining what happens between 1980 and 2000, right? But then it's almost like from 2000 onwards, you, you don't, um, that's when the writer's kitchen becomes very dusty for you. Because right? you, you understand your method very well at the beginning of your career, and obviously time helps with that and gives you distance. But what, so we're about to read, a, for context, a new story from a collection that uh, came out this year. Yeah. And um, what would you say changed between, let's say, Blue Lard and this? Can you say? Or what changed in the weight? And how does it feel? Is there a difference in the feeling of how you write and the intention and the target? Or is it just no, all it. <clears throat> Yep. Наступил период путинской реакции, как бы, да? Вот. Ну, то есть это три разные эпохи, и здесь на они влияли на литературу, и, собственно, на меня тоже. Поэтому книги такие разные. So you understand, I was born in the Soviet Union, then lived through the period of its collapse, then came the period of Putin's reaction. Um, and um, so the, these three periods, of course, they influenced literature and me too, and that's perhaps why my books are so different. Of course, uh, I might excuse myself for this, but that's just the way it is. Um, so I guess we might as well just uh, read this story now. Yeah. Yeah. So this story is called Prism's Space. 
from a new collection and um, probably won't be on English for a while. So exclusive sneak peek. Пространство призмы. Утро призмы начинается чудовищно. Но успев проснуться, она должна значительно выбирать между конусом и кубом. Это два ее старых друга любовника. Необходимо в сотый раз выбрать. Это сопровождается стрессом и слезами. Кого предпочесть сегодня? Страховатую полупрозрачную, наверное, с конуса, источающую ароматы субтропиков с обещанием неожиданного петинга в водопаде или сладкие, прохладные грани Куба напоминающие о грядущем морозе, объятиях, потерянных сиянием иногда загаданным тайным его желанием. Prism's morning begins monstrously. Not having managed to properly wake up, she must make a tormented choice between cone and cube. These are two of her friends with benefits have been for a long time. And it's indispensable that she make this choice for the umpteenth um, um, time, accompanied by stress and tears. Whom would you prefer today? Cone's rough, translucent surface, which exudes the aroma of the subtropics with the promise of unexpected heavy pettings under, under a waterfall, or Cube's chill, smooth faces, which are reminiscent of an impending kiss in the frost, embraces under the northern lights and a secret wish made of ice. Конус строится бесшабашностью, хохотом, ракушками, рыбками и потоками шальных радостей. Куб завораживает спокоен устойчивого благополучия пламенем в камине родового замка, окруженного снежными лесами, Свистящим спуском с гор северным комфортными сказками, развертывающимися новыми пространствами, жизни, налипов суеты и предсказуемости, структурированием мира, который, как горная долина, возрастается бесконечным божественным пространством, не предполагающим Cone overflows with devilry, chuckles, shells, fish, and streams of mad joys. Cube the witches with the calm of sustained well being, of the flame in the fireplace of an ancestral castle surrounded by snow covered forests, of a whistling descent from the mountains of comfy northern tales of unfolding life spaces, totally new, far from hustle, bustle, and unpredictability, all of which structure the world, expanding out like an alpine valley into an infinite divine space, which contains neither loss nor disappointment. Prism amidst a matinal moan, the selection process. There's nothing more horrifying than this. She swallows a little pink sphere and washes it down with water. The little sphere makes the problem of choosing between cone and cube not quite so bitter, as it removes the aftertaste of catastrophicity in the process. All choose in the shower, prison decides. Она никогда не делает этот выбор в постели, только под душем, в антазе или в время растяжки. Посидев на унитазе, она поднимает душ. 
ощущает его идеальный плоскость, его мощный объем, завораживающую увесистость, совершенную сексуальность. Она опирается на эти неизменные острые углы. Ее грани трутся о каждую его плоскость. Углы приятно давят и давят. Теплая вода льется сверху на кухню. Куб все-таки поинтереснее курусу, решает Лиза. Конечно, в нем отсутствует непредсказуемость, спонтанность, внезапно горячие радости, обжигающие лава. Конечно, зато он наполняет меня такой уверенностью в себе, такой силой на преодоление всего внезапно опасного, его грань так четкий и точный, а углы столь беспощадно острые и правильные, что я сразу становлюсь сильнее и самоценнее как личность. She never makes her selection in bed, only in the shower, on the toilet, or doing her morning stretches. After sitting on the toilet for a little while, she takes a shower and chooses cube. Cube, she pronounces. And Cube immediately enters the shower, embraces Prism, and presses her to him. Prism senses his ideal planes, his mighty volume, his bewitching weightiness, and his consummate statuousness. She lets herself go on his immutable sharp corners. Her face is rubbed against each of his planes, his corners pleasantly pressing and invigorating. Warm water pours down onto Cube and Prism. I guess I'd say Cube is more interesting than Cone, Prism decides. Of course, he lacks unpredictability, spontaneity, joy both hot and sudden, plus that burning lava of cash. On the other hand, he fills me with such self-confidence, such strength to overcome everything that's unpredictably dangerous. His faces are so clear and precise, but his corners are so mercil mercilessly sharp and regular that I immediately become stronger and more filled with self-worth as an individual. Cube exudes protection. He strengthens me and expands the horizons of my confidence. После душа куб помогает ей занять растяжкой и раскрытку. Она тянется, крутится, растягиваясь из крючевой мышцы своего красивого и важного тела. После растяжки призма отдается кубу. Их близость гармонична. Она предполагает долгое наслаждение, растающее как знаменитая домино. После близости они Завтракают умный и интересный собеседник. Он сообщает призме только то, что он заставляет ее представлять невозможное или задуматься, соединяя себя. Он любит рассказывать о новых. Приятных путешествиях, но места уже известны для радости, узнавания жизни. Фьорды, замок на краю скалы. Две милые лохматые собаки, прогулки на катере, рыбалка, пикник. В замшелых лунах национальная Блюдо под крепкий национальный напиток, выпиваемый чистый, самый чистый в мире водной водой, 
вечернее событие на шкурах, порядок песок, треск, дроб, камин. Рифа пьет марокканский кофе с добрыми свежайшими сливками северной страны Кубы. Она благодарна ему, она согласна с северным путешествием. После обращения согласия куб исчезает. After the shower, Cube helps her to stretch and unwind. She stretches, twists, pulling and twirling the muscles of her young, beautiful body with his guidance. And he is wise and consistent. After the stretching, Prism gives herself to Cube. Their intimacy is harmonious. It's a lengthy pleasure, growing and growing like the famous Valeri. They breakfast after their intimacy. Cube is a smart and interesting conversationalist. He informs Prism only of that which doesn't force her to imagine the unimaginable or to lose herself in thought, which also might make her lose herself. He loves to tell her of new pleasant travels, but only in places already known to Prism, places where the joy of recognition awaits her. Fjords, a castle on the edge of a cliff, two cute shiny dogs, a boat trip, fishing, a picnic on mossy boulders, a national dish, a company, by a strong national beverage washed down with the purest mountain water in the world. Evening intercourse on the skins of polar foxes, wood crackling in the fireplace. Prism drinks Moroccan coffee flavored with the freshest of creams from Q's northern land. She's grateful to him. She agrees to a trip up north. After acquiring her consent, Q vanishes. Начинается рабочий день прежде. В комфортной и безопасной машине она перемещается в шумном городском пространстве, оказавшись в офисе компании, которая она возглавляет уже 8 лет после смерти ее отца Кулинера, призма занимает свой кабинет. К ней начинают выходить ее подчиненные разнообразные по форме и величине геометрические фигуры. Есть большие с волосоватыми гранями, выступами и впаренными. Есть поменьше, есть эти маленькие простые. Таких больше всего. Весь день призма пристально занимается своей фигурой складывая их, сопрягая или разъединяя фигуры взаимодействуют между собой. Призма следит, чтобы это взаимодействие было гармоничным для всей компании и личность таких людей. So begins Prism's work then. In a safe, comfortable car, she moves through the noisy urban space. Once in the office of the company she's been the head of for eight years since the death of her father, Cylinder, Prism goes into her own office. Her subordinates begin to come in to see her, geometric figures of various sizes and shapes. There are big ones with intricate faces, protuberances and depressions. Then there are smaller ones. Then there are very small and simple ones. Most of them are like that. Prism occupies herself with her figures intently, all day, putting them together, coupling them, or pulling them apart. The figures interact with one another. Prism makes sure that this interaction is harmonious and brings both her and the company a stable profit. Um, and then we zoom forward a little, there's more of a sort of description of Prism's life, uh, which is a very recognizable cityscape that's sort of refracted through this geometric lens. And um, she eventually is going to meet up with her. She's visited her mother who's very ill. She goes to a gallery opening and at the gallery opening, she um, meets Tetrahedron. Right? Tetrahedron? Yes, I've never said it a lot, I just translated um, and, uh, and they strike up a bit of a romance, so that could work. 
Полностью она подъезжает к водному и ночному клубу. Петрайдер радостно встречается. В покрыты уже другим напылением. Он переливается в свете лучей, присаживается к парной стойке. Петрайдер угощает перед коктейлями. Потом приглашает танцевать, они танцуют. Во время танца он шепчет близкие приятные слова. Он в восторге от ее фигуры. Наслышан о ее успехах в бизнесе. Сообщает, что многие известные фигуры завидуют ее красоте и умеют. Близко. Смеются. Они выбирают еще то шепотом, предлагает ей понюхать белого порошка. Раньше призма обожала это делать, и теперь стала осторожнее. Она, бережен, она бережет свою нервную систему. At midnight, she gets driven to a trendy club. Tetrahedron, saying that right, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> Meets her with great joy. His faces are already covered over with a different dusting. He shimmers in the light of the rays. He shines. They pass into the bar and sit down at the counter. Tetrahedron treats Prism to various cocktails, then asks her to dance with him. They dance. During the dancing, Tetrahedron whispers pleasant words into Prism's ear. He can't get enough of her figure. He's heard all about her success in business. He informs her that many famous figures are jealous of her brains and beauty. Prism laughs. They drink some more. In a whispered tone, Tetrahedron invites her to snort some white powder. Prism used to adore doing this, but she's become more cautious. She takes care of her nervous system. Which is why she refuses. Когда этот э, тетрайдер предлагает ей покурить стражику, на это она соглашается. Они проходят в курительную комнату и выкуривают джойн. Жизнь становится весело. Они снова танцуют. Тетрайдер обнимает ее, деликатно касаясь ее нежных мест. Это она предлагает Петрайдеру поехать к ней домой. Благодарность он нежно целует ее верхний мир. Um, then Tetrahedron invites her to smoke some weed. She agrees to this. They pass into the smoking room and roll a joint. Prism's having fun. They dance some more. Tetrahedron embraces her, delicately palpating her tender places. Prism is turned on. She invites Tetrahedron to come home with her. He tenderly kisses her upper corner in gratitude. Оказавшись дома у Призмы, они занимаются любовью. Тетрайдер молод и полон энергии. Может Наводит призму до череды оргазмов, потом качает сам и благодарно облизывает нежную край призму. Призма с приятным изнеможением. Она целует Петрайдера и деликатно просит его удалиться, потому что спит всегда одна. И предпочитает просыпаться в одиночестве. Петрайдер понимает призму. Он покидает ее дом. Засыпая, призма командует луч. Once they're at Prism's house, they make love. Tetrahedron is young and full of energy. 
He brings Prism to a whole series of orgasms, then comes himself and licks Prism's lower face as a sign of gratitude. Prism is pleasantly exhausted. She kisses Tetrahedron, then asks him to leave delicately because she always sleeps on her own and prefers to wake up alone. Tetrahedron gets it. He leaves her, he leaves her house. Falling asleep, Prism commands the ray. In the bedroom's gloomy space, the thinnest ray of light begins to shine. It comes to rest upon Prism's bosom, now refracted, now refracted. It breaks up into the seven colors of the rainbow inside of Prism. They fill Prism's interior space shimmeringly. Prism falls asleep, satiated and content. We are doing audience questions. Um, I would also like to say, though, just as a side note, that I think there is quite a lot of variety in the 20 years of work that is, um, well, really, it's 40 years of work that's going to be coming out in the next five or six years. But even if, so if we're talking about the early work versus the later work, even within the later work, there's quite a bit of variety. And for those of you who've read Tulare, you can probably already feel that the story is quite a bit different from Tulare, which is quite a bit different from the Blizzard, which is quite a bit different from, I don't know, Dr. Garin, a very big one, which is coming from MIRB in three years. So read all of them and find out about the very many different writers inside of Vladimir and um, all the various different books they've written, which have certain similarities, but uh, not too many. You can take questions, and I'll bring a microphone to you. You've got one in the front here. I'll start from the front. Hi, uh, this question is for Max. Um, in the Tadulia, I found um, you know, a variety of different accents and manners of speaking. Some of them seem to approximate sort of being Shakespearean English in the English version, and some of them uh, approximate like a working class uh, dialect, and there's more. Um, so the question is obviously, you know, there's no direct equivalent of that in Russia. How did you uh, how did you make that transition, or where are they coming from in the first place? I actually think the, um, I'm very lucky. Because as Nabokov said, English and Russian are two geniuses. Uh, and I think they're very rich literary languages with a lot of um, parallels between them. So um, I, I don't, I mean, I know a few other languages. And I, I'm not quite as well versed in the literary tradition. But for example, we're dealing with the working class, the way you said dialect, which really what we're dealing with is a sort of plain spoken uh, narrative, which might be represented in. In the English tradition by something like Faulkner or Cormac McCarthy, we have a rich tradition of that. So when Vladimir plays with something like that, and I see that he's riffing on a certain tradition of Russian writers, I can kind of reach into my own reading experience and look for an equivalent and then just play with it. Um, so I think it's, a, it, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one similarity in terms of the metaphysics, as Vladimir would say. It's, um, so when there's a sort of medieval sounding word, um, I'll reach for an equivalent medieval sounding word from, you know, a, a, a sort of distorted Chaucer that I screw with on my own or uh, something like that. But I think, so the, the equivalences are pretty, pretty direct, I think. Um, and I think we're lucky, I'm lucky that English has so many literary languages to match up with Russian ones. I mean, I, I kind of wish I'd written it afterward. Um, there's a funny story about Ezra Pound. Um, 
who showed the Kantos to Mussolini. Now, if you've read the Kantos, you know that they're very, very, very dense and unreadable. Um, and he, he showed them to Mussolini, and Mussolini didn't want to meet with him in the first place and was trying to push off the meeting and said, Oh, this crazy uh, American poet is doing these radio shows, no one can understand, uh, wants to show me his book. I guess I have to do it because he's sort of like the prestige fascist from America or whatever. And Count showed him the contos, and Count and Mussolini looked at it for two seconds and he said, Ah, ma questo è divertente, which means like, Oh, what a cool little thing. And Count, of course, famously wrote a whole section of the contos saying, The great man had understood it before anyone else. <laughs> um, and so I kind of was going with that mentality with uh, not writing an afterwards, thinking it would speak for itself, not to Mussolini, I would hope, but you know, to, to normal readers. But uh, I wish I had written an afterward, and I think it was going to be a reissue of Hillary explaining some of these choices for the next five years. So that's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is my name, you know, I can you after the session is like that again, I got written on it. Um, I would like to, as I understand, my friend of Richnika, that he told me where the shit is, and I, I'm not Russian, but how can I, how can I, how can I, how can I, Well, um, so I am very honored uh, to be in your presence, and um, really uh, uh, amazed to be here. But I think, like, out of all the like giants of Russian literary world, uh, you most precisely predicted like how, how the Russia is going to happen. Like, our attitude, the Russian speakers towards the writers, is much more. You know, but the Parashe, then uh, like we we consider you prophets and stuff. And stuff. And I'm sorry, I, I'm wearing away from the literary to more of a political thing. But like Daniel Papik, Daniel Papik, on the day of Papik, like are you like it's like basically okay, it's kind of short. You think Russia's gonna fall apart, or is it gonna become like Daniel Papik? Actually, it's all from and like this, uh, you know. Опубликовал его по Критики писали, ну, и, и, и русские, да, и, и маленькие, что это, ну, это такие, как бы, фантазии Сорокина, да? ну, вот, эти фантазии. Daily Krishnik was written 15 years ago, and when I published it, critics in both Russia and Germany were sort of saying, well, these are just sort of surreal fantasies. Да, 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 да. Критик писал, наверное, это похмелье. One critic even wrote, this is probably a hangover fantasy. А потом шли годы, и как-то критики стали другие писать. И не только критики, что Такое впечатление, что в Кремле считают день обличника как, как, как методическое пособие. Um, and then, um, um, that years passed and critics began to write, write differently about it. And not just critics, there was the impression that this book was being read in the Kremlin as a, uh, let's say, instruction manual.
as a writer, of course, I was happy because it was everything was coming true that I'd written. But as a citizen, I was absolutely horrified. No, I can say that each writer has a внутренняя антенна, она улавливает вибрации общества. Every writer has a kind of internal antenna that picks up the vibrations in society. Может быть, я уловил некие вибрации, написал эту книгу, которая, в общем, была довольно неожиданной. Perhaps I picked up certain vibrations and then wrote this book, which also I have to say was pretty unexpected for me too. But it wasn't any sort of act of prophecy because of course intentional acts of prophecy are not possible. Day of the Epitomy, which was published um, a while ago by Karash Jaisen I think in 2012. 2012, I think. That is uh, very much available. I saw it just now at City Lights. Hold on. Day of the Epitomy. Oh, okay. Questions? Right here. Um, I'll speak English or I can translate. Um, my main question is Have you been able to write in the last eight months? Um, or the seven years that you mentioned passed between the fall of the Soviet Union and the beginning to write again? Are you experiencing a similar transitional period? Вы знаете, мы с женой уехали из Москвы, из России, за два дня до начала этой чудовищной бессмысленной войны. You know, my wife and I uh, left Russia just a few days before this uh, brutal, senseless war in Ukraine began by accident. Естественно. Я не ожидал, что безумие Путина зайдет так далеко. Naturally, I didn't expect for Putin's insanity to go quite so far. Я не ожидал этой войны. I didn't expect this war. И надо сказать, что вот это, ну, прошло уже 8 месяцев, я не могу написать источник. And I have to say that um, these eight months have passed, and I can't write a single verse. I can't write a single line. Когда война идет, и она касается тебя и и твои друзей в Украине, собственно, то лучше помолчать. When a war is happening and affects you and your family and your friends and everyone else, you know, in Ukraine, it's better just to be quiet. И вообще, надо сказать, что, как правило, романы о войнах пишутся после этих войн. And it's worth being said that as a general rule, war, uh, novels about war are written after the wars they're about. Так что э, роза сейчас не получается, но еще статьи не могу. So, and, yeah, prose isn't happening right now, but I do occasionally write articles. Я хотела спросить, вы сказали, что 
Аналитичника и вот для вас неожиданные книги. И, собственно, для всех остальных тоже естественно, потому что у вас совершенно что-то невероятное. А, и вопрос в том, как, как вам пришла идея этой книги, ну, как, как она появилась, идея именно вот об этом написать и так. Неожиданно, на самом деле, нет, ну, естественно, что-то накопилось внутри, но ну, это, как обычно, написать будет. Вот, но конкретно вот, толчок вот такой, вот, вот это одно случай. Naturally, something had accumulated inside me, as often happens with writers, but there was one um, shell, let's say, that um, did, that did come to pass. Те годы я была собака, гибридка. Those years I had a dog, a whippet. Вот, собственно, вы представляете, это очень изящное. We can imagine it's a very uh, refined animal. And um, one day, I sort of wanted to play a trick on, on the dog, and I bought this enormous um, bull bone or beef bone at a market with a bit of in Manukovo with a bit of meat on it. Вот, я на вернулся домой и Возварил нас на вот этот яркий такой настоящий снег, кинул эту кость, и о, собака выглядела. Я подумал, что он будет о, делать. Эта кость о, почти такого же размера, как и он. And I came back home and I threw the uh, I threw the bone into the bright snow in the yard on this sunny day, and I sort of thought, what is this dog going to do? The bone is about the same size as the dog. В нем было что-то и э, завораживающее, и э, красивое, и угрожающее. And at that moment, the dog did a sort of uh, ritual dance around the bone. And if there was something enchanting and refined, but also something uh, menacing. Он никогда не совершал такой танц. Never done such a dance before. И... Я раскрыл рот, раскрыл рот от удивления. And I was uh, just totally shocked, basically. И, в общем, через час где-то я сел писать меня точно. And right after that, I sat down to write the description. Okay, great. I was just wondering when you approach the story uh, to write it, uh, is the genesis of it, does it come typically from a character that you imagine or a line of dialogue or a situation? Uh, 
Это очень тонкие дела. То есть начало это как рождение кристалла в перенасыщенном растворе. В неожиданном месте и неожиданное время. It's a very delicate business. It's like coming into being of a crystal and an oversaturated, oversaturated substance. It tends to happen in an unexpected moment and uh, in an unexpected way. These impulses are actually impossible to explain. Но, но But. должен быть этот перенасыщенный Impulse itself was shown, like the dog was saying the dog wasn't the oversaturated substance, it was just a little thing. It was a straw that broke the camel's back. So you have the accumulation, then the straw breaks the camel's back. It's hard to explain. Yeah. <laughs> These are inexplicable things. Uh, creation is a divine process after all. Precisely for that reason, we can't get by without our preparation. Please forgive me for a non literary question. You um, speak in as much detail as you would care to do about your prognosis of how this senseless brutal war will end. Я думаю, что она закончится победой в Украине. I think we'll end with the victory of Ukraine. Uh, you said you did not mean to uh, predict the future, but your antennas uh, from vibration. Do you think that if you, you know, if you travel, you read, do you think that if you were living somewhere else in the world, maybe in the West, your antennas might feel something different sometimes? Я думаю, что здесь, наверное, человек бы I think in that case, a different person would be saying here, yeah, he would have written, he would be uh, speaking a different language here, so he would have different books. Yeah. Were any of your works directly influenced or inspired by another book you had read or were reading at the time?
Дело в том, что вся прочитанная литература – это некий океан, да? и он влияет, естественно, своими приемами и отливами. Но что-то выделить очень трудно. The thing is, all the books I've read, all the literature I've read, is a sort of ocean that does, of course, influence me with its uh, tides in and out. But to pick one thing out of that ocean is quite difficult. I would say that what always attracted me was literature, where there is the breath of metaphysics. I can only say that I've always been attracted to literature where in breathes the breath of metaphysics. And I'm, um, I'm very indifferent to Bellet, so I'm uh, pretty, pretty gross for no reason. I like hard literary drugs. Mostoyevsky, Tolstoy, Lis, Kafka. Nabokov, Beckett, это Хармс, Латонов, это тяжелый язык. So all those names, um, which I think you understood all, except for Ulysses, which is the definition, that's hard literary drugs. Thank you very much. And the next one has a great program tonight. Savoria is here at Kittis. It's an incredible deep dive. It's the past, present, future, fantasy, political critique, satire. It's so layered and bodacious. So I hope people buy a copy when it's signed. And therefore, Hearts is also cool. It's also got a lot of illustrations. Very shocking. So. <laughs>